If you paid attention to the game's discourse on the internet during 2019 and 2020, then I pity you and your poor mother. You might have noticed a reoccurring argument about some species from fantasy media, specifically orcs. Again, a fucking game. Now not to worry. This episode isn't going to be just another member of the chorus talking about how if all orcs in a game are blindly evil, that it's racist. Instead, we want to discuss how that particular choice is simply bad game design. And why bad game design is racist. A fabulous loophole our subscribers saw right through. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Thanks so much to NordVPN for sponsoring today's episode. Cause most of the internet refuses to. Real quick up top, please welcome James Mendez Hodes, who guest wrote this episode. All right, I was just sitting at home watching cartoons. Much of the recent conversation on orcs points out that characterizing a whole species in your game as ugly, warlike, and malevolent might be harmful to real-world groups regularly mischaracterized as ugly, warlike, and malevolent. <laughs> killed a white man since 76. You know what would redeem our last shitty take? Comparing black people to musty, snaggletoothed, caveman-browed, ashy-ass orcs. I hope the ad revenue was worth the ass hoopin' you've got coming. However, this video isn't that. Though if you want more on that discussion, Mendez breaks it down wonderfully over on his website, and we'll have a link to that in the description. No! No! But here, we're going to talk about something related. Why characterizing a group like this in your game can be lazy at best, and at worst, actively harmful to the world you're creating. Hey, you guys think this might end up being a metaphor for something or not? When designing a game's world and populating it with fictional species, a designer might be tempted to differentiate them from one another by certain inalienable qualities, like their moral alignment. Violent versus peaceful, law versus chaos, good versus evil, and the like. It's a common trope in speculative fiction, but especially in the context of a game. This trope is common, which implies it's also successful in most cases, but let's waste eight minutes stirring up a dead take to flaunt our moral superiority. Painting an entire species with the same moral brush actually weakens the entire thing. Is that a dick? This idea that a certain subgroup, like race, nationality, or sex, has inalienable traits, is called biological essentialism, or simply bioessentialism. I'm positive every race you've just mentioned appreciates being likened to hideous fictional creatures without agency. Extra credits took the first step at the Million Man March. And it's a valid way to talk about qualities like how many legs an animal has, or whether it can fly. But all too often, this concept gets misused in untrue statements, like pit bulls are a violent breed, men are more logical than women, based, or Asians are better at math. I have it on good authority that Asians are better at math. Everyone who watched this video multiplied their down votes by three, carried the one in and subscribed by the second power. Now chances are, if a game is set in the real world, that the designers are avoiding these tropes because they aren't real, as multiple fields of societal and hard science can readily prove to you. But speculative fiction offers us an opportunity to reify or make real various things which don't exist or to exaggerate things which do. And then the video continued without a shred of self-awareness. Now bioessentialism is a tempting idea in fantasy for some of the same reasons as it is in the real world. Nigga, uh... No. Because to our human minds, broad generalizations are comforting. They reduce the world to simple cut and dry categories. All orcs bad, all elves good. Gamer equals Nazi. But just like in the real world, bioessentialism can present problems in fiction as well. Specifically, a moral one. The idea that a sapient species can inherently tend towards good or evil acts, or lawful or chaotic ones. So, not only do harmful ideas infect fiction, you can't even reference harmful ideas in fiction because said ideas will make the consumer cause harm. Have you ever given someone an orgasm? And that moral essentialism actually undercuts the greatest strength games can bring to storytelling the player's own power to make meaningful, interesting choices and judgments for their characters, including moral ones. You're only half wrong here. You can make characters and their decisions more interesting if they contradict their set roles, but implying that you can't make a meaningful game with a simple good v evil plot is narrow-minded and ridiculous. So if a game's creative choices apply a moral valuation to every member of an entire species before the players even meet them, well, now that's just taking that power away from the players. Don't the video game programmers know these horrible monsters have hopes and dreams? Dracoat wanted to open a juice bar. Also, cute-fying your bad guys doesn't legitimize your point. And in turn, if a group of orcs, for instance, doesn't even have a choice about their actions, are they actually evil? You guys think this might end up being a metaphor for something? Because look, if a person, say, destroys a house, we call that evil because they chose to do so. But if a tornado destroys a house, well, I mean, is wind evil? No. Hey, yo, what 
Wind is an act of nature unbound by thought, agency, or programming. If instead you said if a raccoon destroys a house for food and shelter, is that raccoon evil? You may have had a point. It's still an unfair comparison, but an improvement from whatever Bill Paxton from Twister bullshit you just said. Therefore, if a game's world building chooses to program every member of a species to destroy, Aren't they more like the tornado? No, you dick! Now, if the player's characters are able to make moral choices, but an entire class of NPCs is inherently evil regardless of their choice, then the game is either telling the player that moral choices don't matter, or it's simply driving a wedge between the player's morality and the morality that applies to the rest of the world, blocking the player from further becoming a part of it. Sometimes bad gameplay is just that bad gameplay. It's not that deep, fam. But now you might be asking, what if you're playing the kind of game where you're engaging in violence because it's exciting and fun? Yes! Maybe the goal is to take moral calculus out of the problem. Yes! Sure, one solution might be saying, all orcs are evil, go ahead and shoot them. But in that situation, as soon as someone inadvertently feels some empathy, the easy answer becomes less easy. Yes! Well! We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. And if the goal of your game is to stop players from engaging in moral debates and just fight some bad guys, you kinda gotta say something more reliable than, oh, it's fine, they were all born this way. Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? Fortunately, the real world's made progress on this problem, because sometimes in this day and age, people actually bear visual signifiers which say, I'm evil, not because of where I was born, but because of the choices I've made, such as Nazi uniforms and clan hoods. What if said evil people were born into that environment and had no choice in their belief system? There's this thing called brainwashing I think you need to familiarize yourself with. And if the statement that a game is making with its backstory and symbols is that an enemy had a choice and they chose wrong, then that gets way less complicated for a game that's interested in uncomplicated violence. Hmm. Born evil equals immoral kill. Choose evil equals moral kill. I think you have this backwards. Killing someone born evil would have much less moral dilemma. There's no rehabilitating them. While killing those who chose evil would be much more ethically corrupt. Because that individual is multifaceted, having the potential for good as well as evil. So whether a game does or doesn't want its players to overthink their character's moral choices, evil as a choice is just more effective than evil as a bioessential trait. Xenomorphs aren't evil, they're animals you fuck with. But then of course if everyone wearing the evil team uniform happens to be an orc, or if every orc happens to have chosen Team Evil, the game wouldn't exactly be communicating that difference very well. The operative word being choice implying at one point good was a viable option. You fucking idiot. A quick fix here would be to show some diversity in the Evil Team's hiring practices. Oh! For instance, with evil humans and elves as well as orcs. Or conversely, introduce orcs who have chosen good and neutral as well as evil. Not to worry, I have a permit. This just says... I can do what I want. Broad moral generalizations about species or culture not only doesn't make internal sense, but it also leads to less evocative, less rewarding worlds and games. This is your opinion. This way, players won't be incentivized to make snap judgments about our game's orcs or aliens or undead based on moral absolutes or body types. Instead, we'll all be driven to investigate, explore, and learn. Our players will invest themselves more in our games. And because they're human, ask the hard questions to push our design into even more enriching and unexpected places. Sometimes I watch an extra credits video and wonder what it feels like to have your tongue that far up your own ass. Plus, you know, maybe if we ditch this whole evil races line of thinking, if one day orcs or extra dimensional horrors or even isekai protagonists pop out of a portal, they'll offer us humans the same courtesy. I'd call that a win-win. Video games aren't real life, you festering pustule of a man baby. A big extra credits thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One for their continued legendary patronage. Fuck you all for directly funding terrorism.